Uh, good evening, Chaos Treff. Hallo alle zusammen. Ich würde den Vortrag gerne auf Englisch halten. Um, I would like to give this talk in English. Is that a problem to anyone? Please raise your, raise your hand right now. I'll be silent forever. Okay, people choose the silence. That's good. I like silence. So, um, first question is um, to everyone in the room. Who has used Python before? I think it's probably, yeah, as I assumed, pretty much everyone. Who has used NumPy before to do some numerical computations? That's also pretty much everyone. Okay, that's, that's actually quite good. Because what I'm going to talk about today is basically, well, one could say an alternative NumPy. It's not really NumPy, it's just some sort of a re-implementation. Um, it's intended to be exactly um, interchangeable with NumPy. And it aims at performing, like at, at, at giving you the ability to automatically parallelize your code, right? Such that uh, big computations can be done in parallel automatically without you actually changing a single line of code. I'll demonstrate that in a second. Um, so first, maybe give you a little bit of an introduction into the project by itself. So the project I'm going to talk about is not the pizza stack. It's actually um, called Borium. Um, after Niels Bohr, because it's actually developed in the Niels Bohr Institute, where I had the pleasure of visiting a couple of times. Um, and after the element, chemical element, which is named after Niels Bohr, the URL is BH107. So it's actually rather um, simple to remember. And it'll redirect you directly to the sparse documentation which is available, unfortunately. So, as I said, the project is Borium. It's rather young in the sense that it's only been around for, I think, four or five years, basically only driven by a single group, um, as I said, in the Niels Bohr Institute. And so far, I think there is one big application, meaning there is one scientific code around, which does um, numerical computations in Borium, um, namely they do ocean flow simulations. And they've just managed in a master thesis to um, just take the whole old code, which existed, of course, Fortran 77, how could, else could it be, and port it to Borio, <laughs> to Python. And yeah, so that's, that's the one project which is this. But the people um, both on the side of the ocean um, simulation and on the side of Borium are actually quite, uh, yeah, quite pushing this thing. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I myself am actually quite convinced now that I've been there for a while. All right, let's see, let's see what it can actually do. Um, so, I've written a very short demonstration script uh, in Python, of course, um, which basically does nothing else than a bit of statistical analysis. So, it computes certain statistical moments um, in the standard way um, and gen just basically prints them and does the, does the timing for that period of code, right? And the main script, uh, the main function just <laughs> calls this compute for computing the means on uh, five random arrays of a given size which one can specify on the command line, right? That's pretty much all which happens, right? So just very s short demonstration. If I run the script, um, it basically takes no time, right? Because the default input is, I think, 20 or something, so that's pretty much done within a couple of, well, not even seconds. So if I go to larger inputs, let's write it like this for clarity so that people can actually read what I mean. So this is just a fancy way of writing two million, right? <laughs> so if I, if I run it with two million, you can see it already takes a little while. And as one expects for the random distribution, um, the mean is a half, so the random distribution, uh, uniform distribution between zero and one. And I hope, I haven't checked, that the other moments are good too. Um, let's see how this continues if we go to even larger input, let's say 10 million, right? So, I mean, my CPU is pretty recent. Um, that's why I had to disable hyperthreading, unfortunately. But um, the point is that it's, well, it still takes a while. I mean, now we're talking about seconds, right? It's still fine. Um, if I go to even larger input, it's less fun. Why is this? I mean, NumPy, as you all know, has a hopefully no, has a C backend, right? So it doesn't actually do its computation in Python. It does the computation in C. And the C code is 
re really quite well optimized, one has to say. In many cases, they even fall back to the standard implementations of BLAST and so on to um, do the numerical computations as, well, nowadays, pretty much the fastest way one can do it, like state of the art. The thing is, however, that NumPy is only single threaded, which means that right now all these computations here are done one instruction after the next. So, I mean, this, this certainly has a limit. And, um, yeah, ideally one would like to parallelize this for bigger inputs, like, for example, the 30 million, millions we have right now. And the way one does this, if one has Borium installed, is essentially I just say, all right, I want to do Python, and I want to use Borium. So now it's parallel. That's all I have to do. I mean, it still takes a while. I'll talk about this in a second. Um, but the next iteration should be a little bit faster. Yeah, it is. Now it's 3.5 seconds for one of the goals, 3.8, and so on. I mean, you see, it doesn't really give us very much at the very moment, but I can assure you, I mean, this is only two threads. As a, uh, at the moment, my, uh, as I disabled hyper-threading, this CPU only has two nodes, which means that right now it's only two threads. So, I mean, this speed-up is not, it's not impressive, but it shows you that there's some potential. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about why is the first iteration not that much better. The reason is because what, well, the way Borium achieves this um, is it does JIT compilation, which means it does some introspection of the hardware which is available on your machine, um, and basically, based on that hardware, it compiles a computational kernel, a computational instruction, which um, essentially represents the problem you want to solve. And that is compiled just in time before the instruction is executed um, for your machine hardware, right? And this compilation, of course, takes time. This is why the first iteration is so much longer. Well, not so much, but a little longer. And the other ones basically can reuse whatever is available and therefore are faster. Okay. So this means um, Borium is not necessarily very good for small problems, right? Because, of course, for small problems, the compilation time is going to dominate. But it's better, it's becoming better and better the more you need to do exactly the same thing. Because these kernels are um, actually really highly specific to the kind of computation you need to do. Um, which is both an advantage and a disadvantage. So the disadvantage, of course, is if you look, for example, again in my script, um, you see that, I mean, I do the calculation of, three, uh, of, of, uh, of the first four moments here, and all of these computations here will be a different kernel, which means that it actually needs to compile at least four, I would actually guess it's probably around 20 kernels in this case. I mean, it's not quite clear um, for someone who, who doesn't really know some of the insights what, is, what counts as a kernel and what not. I'm not going to go into that, but the point is that um, it's not just once it needs to compile here. It needs to compile around 20 times. Um, the advantage is, so that's the disadvantage. It costs 20 times some, some costs for the compiling. The advantage is that it can do certain things, um, certain optimizations which are highly specific to the exact problem, which is, for example, called array fusion. So if you, if you think about these two instructions here, what is happening is in order to compute the average, it needs to go through all of the array elements here, of course, and needs to sum them up. Later down here, in order to comp compute the higher moments, it needs to do the same thing again and basically use the average here in order to compute um, yeah, the moments, essentially. What Borium actually does is, well, it notices that you only need the value at this very point, which means that everything which is done here and here can essentially be done at the same time, right? Because you're only interested in what comes out in the very end. That's called array fusion. So it looks at the array operations which are done until you actually need the value. And in some cases, you can take some loops and just intertwine them. In this case, this would, for example, happen. And that actually speeds up your calculation in many cases. And it does something else. It avoids temporaries, right? If you think here, I mean, in this case, it's just a scalar value. But of course, if you think not just about um, matrices or linear vectors, but about tensors, it could be that these things are actually matrices or tensors, so very large objects. So in NumPy, you actually need to have them in memory at this very point. Whereas in Borium, since it basically streamlines everything until you 
really return the final result right here, it can actually not put them in memory, which means it avoids those temporaries. That's, in many cases, rather nice. All right, so I showed you um, how to speed up on my small machine. Let's go, let's go to, a, to a compute cluster. I basically have the same um, script right here as well. And I'm gonna use the same call. Speaking of compute cluster, can you just show an LSCPU or something like that? Or um, something? Yeah, yeah, I will. Just get it in the history. So let's do a top. So this, this node has 12 machines, but actually this is the only the login node. I should probably actually go to the actual compute and I should use a screen for that. All right, so now I'm on the actual compute node and for chatty I'll do an LCPU, which shows you that this machine has 32 CPUs. Uh, not very awesome CPUs, but that's not the point for now. Right, so in <laughs> fact you... Well, all the most recent AMD ones have worked. Yeah, that's not recent though. It's about, <laughs> uh, I think it's three years old or something. Um, so if you look, um, here one iteration with uh, 30 million size took um, in the non-parallel version took 5.2 seconds. Here you'll see it'll be a lot longer. That's why I won't do 30 million. Uh, just to speed up the whole thing. So now I do it uh, first single-threaded maybe, just to show the difference. So um, that's single-threaded now because I just used the code as it is. You see it now takes four seconds, even though I reduced the problem size from 30 to 10 million. Um, and wait a second, one more. Yeah, so four seconds really is sometimes too long already in my opinion, in this case, for example. And now we're done. So let's, uh, and I should probably, because I have to mess a little bit, because I actually, it's not by default installed, so I had to do this myself. Uh, I made a typo. All right, so now, something is wrong because this version unfortunately is only Python 2. But the point is it works on Python 2 and Python 3. The reason why I have Python 2 here is not because of, is, is basically because of the old machine. It's like some old Ubuntu or whatever, I don't know. Um, and it works on, um, on, well, on Windows and, no, it doesn't work on Windows, but that's not really a problem. Um, it, works, it works on Mac and on Linux, of course, um, some other Unixes as well, I think. And um, I mean, I only show the Python bindings. In fact, they have bindings to C Sharp, C++, and a couple of other things as well. So if you want to use this from other programming languages, like I actually do it mostly from C++, but that's also possible. All right, so now we reduced our time from four seconds to around a half, right? So that's rather nice. And, and if you do the right settings, as I'll show in a second, you also get some profiling. So here you see, in fact, it actually did, um, Something, uh, whatever. Yeah, so, so you see it actually did 26 kernels. And yeah, it gives you some statistics. But the point I want to show is that, for example, in this case, it spent uh, 2.6 seconds in compiling. All right, uh, let's look, look at GPU parallelization. So, so far I've only shown CPU parallelization, but the whole the thing can also do GPU, yeah? Yes, sir, maybe I didn't get the concept of something about pre-compilation and optimization during pre-compilation, but where is the parallel thing in there? Okay. Um, yeah, okay, maybe I should make that more clear. That's, that's a good question. All right, um, so what, what standard NumPy does is it, as Python in general, it, it reads through the all of your script and it instructs, well, it executes line by line, right? So there's just plainly what you write is what is done. That's not how NumPy, uh, sorry, that's not how Borium does it. How Borium does it, it reads essentially the, the Python code as you give it to Borium, and um, it processes into an intermediate language, the Borium intermediate language, okay? And only in certain situations, like for example, when you request the result by, for example, com um, yeah, by explicitly asking for it or by converting it to a number, that's when the actual computation is executed. And that means it knows everything about um, 
the instructions that you pushed onto the queue by your usual Python code, and then it does the optimization on that Python on that code in the Borium intermediate language, right? That's the optimization part, and then it takes this optimized um, code, spills out some C, and compiles it, and then it executes that, takes the result, and gives it back to you in Python. That's essentially how it works. I and hope this optimized code is then easily parallelizable because how it yes, yes, it. yes, exactly. So, so the way the reason it works is because yeah, as you yeah, exactly. So, so the, the optimization of the whole uh, process leads to leads to code which is easy to parallelize in an automatic way. Yeah, exactly. So does Boolean parallelize, parallelize loops like just itself that decides? I yeah. think this Okay, but how do you ensure that you don't run all these kinds of radius conditions and anything? You don't have to do that. Borium does that for you. But it knows. Yeah, but the thing is, the thing is, it knows what is the input data, right? I mean, you tell it here, A is input, right? So it knows that. It knows where it is because NumPy is stored it somewhere in the memory location. So it can just, and I mean, you're not actually modifying that input data in this moment, right? You're just taking it, you do something with it, and you return it. In fact, you could modify it, in which case Borium would do a copy implicitly, right? But the point is that, um, since you only read from one location and write to another, the thing in between, you don't have race conditions if you do it properly. And that part, you don't have to, you don't have to assure yourself. That's done by it automatically. So basically, if I have an, if I have an array of like three elements, then Borium would compute each of those elements on a separate core. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Or whatever is more appropriate. Yeah. Because the thing is that, I mean, it's not always as simple as that. Sometimes it's easier to compute a block. But yeah, yeah. essentially that's what it was. Essentially, Borium yeah. would use it if you only have three elements yeah. in your array. But so in, in, in some sense, you can, you, can, you can now think of the Python code as being some meta language in which you tell Borium what should be done. And you don't actually do it. It's done at some other point, some later point, where there's more information around. Um, does that make it clear? Good. All right. Um, so now I have to mess with the environment. So the thing is that by default, Borium does um, no GPU parallelization, but as I can show you with um, the CL info program from Open uh, from OpenCL. We have an AMD or a couple of AMD graphics cards available, so one could try and use those. In fact, one, the way one does this is one needs to configure something. I'll show you the configure file in a second. Essentially, what I do here is I tell it first use OpenCL and only if you can't, then use OpenMP. Right? And now I run the same thing again. And it'll still take a while because now it needs to compile a bit more. But now it's actually running on GPUs. You don't see it, but like you don't see it while it runs, but you see it in the profile because now you have an output for OpenMP and an output for OpenCL, right? So now it's actually doing it, yeah, on both things. Okay, um, just to show it, so Borium can be configured with a whole big lot of options. So, for example, the way things are compiled and whatever. But in my experience, actually, the defaults work rather well. So the only case where you really need to mess is, for example, if you want to use GPUs. But I guess that's also not like a standard use case. Um, is there anything else I wanted to say? Let me just quickly check. Ah, yeah. OK. Um, all right. So this, so are there questions up to now, actually? Let me go to those first. No? All right. So that was now in the command line, right? That's fine for us, I guess. But there are people, as you might know, which are not that great in the command line. That's not a problem, because they have actually rather good integration with things like Jupyter and, oh, that's a bit too large, maybe, um, and others. So, I mean, in Jupyter, you can't just, um, you can't just use this minus M Borium thingy. Instead, what you can do is just say import Borium as NP. Right, so instead of import NumPy as MP, you just use import Borium as MP, and that's it, right? 
Um, and maybe if you want to show off, you can, you can use, for example, a profiling context, and then it gives you exactly the statistics I showed you. Um, yeah. In theory, what should also work, but I didn't manage to get it, is they have made a special um, IPython command thingy percent percent borium. So, as I said, I didn't manage to get it to work, but theoretically speaking, <laughs> we would now run the cell and would do it on, on borium instead of NumPy. Doesn't work. I don't know why. I uh, haven't managed to fight a bug, this, but I will. So, it should work. It doesn't, though. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I convinced you, but I personally think that this is really a nice way to, in general, do scientific coding. Because um, now you as a scientist can just write the plain algorithm. And somebody else who knows much more about race conditions and all that sort of stuff can figure out clever ways to do the parallelization. This certainly doesn't apply to all kind of problems. I mean, essentially, you need to code them in this very specific NumPy way. Um, which can get really annoying if any one of you started looking at broadcasting at some point in this time. I think it's a real mess, but all right, it's a, it's a way to do it, and um, if you do it right with Borium, you can also paralyze it. Um, and I think with that, I would pretty much like to close, and if there are more questions, I'm really happy to answer them now or later. Yeah, please. Speaking of scientific software, do they have um, do they have test coverage for the Borium source code? They don't have test coverage, but they have excessive tests. Okay. So whenever you push something, they test on graphics cards, OpenCL and CUDA. Oh, I didn't mention they also have CUDA. Um, OpenCL and CUDA, macOS, Ubuntu, um, Travis, of course. Um, yeah, so a whole lot of stuff. So and they always test against standard Bor uh, standard NumPy. So they assure that at least for the parts which are implemented, I mean, not everything of NumPy is in Borium yet, unfortunately, but they have an automatic fallback mechanism, so you can still write your scripts and they will work. Um, yeah, uh, but they have excessive tests. So in the order of, I don't know, thousands, really. So it's definitely good. It's definitely well tested. And they, and they take uh, NumPy as a reference and see that Borium still can reproduce what NumPy can give. Yeah, with the numerical errors, of course. But yeah, exactly, that's how it is. And what they are work they, they're working on many things. So um, one project, which unfortunately didn't manage it, is uh, w they wanted to have an FPGA implementation of the Borium bytecode. Didn't work, unfortunately. Um, they are currently working on getting things like uh, LAPAC and others directly into Borium. Why is this nice? Because they are, they are actually... Um, CUDA or OpenCL adapted versions of all the standard linear algebra um, um, linear algebra codes as well, right? And of course, if you have the power to just use a simple environment variable to switch between OpenGL or what, uh, OpenGL and um, sorry, CUDA, CUDA of course, CUDA and, and 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 the CPU implementations, you can also switch the backend for the linear algebra library on the fly, and that's exactly the plan. So they have a PhD working on that right now. Um, yeah, and I mean, there are some, there's some limitations, as I said, so uh, in fact, actually, one of the things that I would like to work on during my postdoc, which I will coincidentally be doing with these guys, hopefully, if the money comes in, but yeah, so, so the thing is, what I would like to work on is to um, limit this problem of always running things on Borium, so to basically have some sort of transparent way to switch between natively running it non-parallel on BLAS and then running it only on Borium when you know, okay, the, like the just entire compilation is not going to cost me too much compared to just running it. Yeah, so I mean, there, there are ways to do it. There, they have ideas, I have ideas, we have ideas, and I'm really, yeah, I really think this is a good project. It's making some progress. Anything else? Thank you.